And could you open your Bibles to Psalm 127? And we're reading verse 1. Psalm 127, uh, verse 1, my Bible says, Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. You might ask, what does this have to do with forgiveness? The answer is, absolutely nothing. But it does remind us, that whatever we're about to do, we need to include the Lord for it to be anything of lasting value. And so join with me now in prayer uh, before we open. And Lord, we ask and invite you. We ask for the presence and power of your Holy Spirit to bless us, to attend us, to open the minds and the hearts to receive the message here this morning. And we ask more than that. We ask if there be any long-held resentment, any roots of bitterness, any spiritual strongholds where people have been holding on to unforgiveness. We ask that this message would soften their hearts, would have them realize that you have asked us not to carry such things. You've asked us to lay them down, to give them to you, that we might worship you, that we might walk free and unencumbered before you. Father, we thank you and praise you, and we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as I said, the topic this morning is on forgiveness. Not unexpectedly, it usually gets a little quiet when this topic is considered. For who among us has not had occasion to struggle with unforgiveness in our hearts? Maybe in the past, maybe in the present, and most certainly in our future. I can safely say this, when I think of the Lord's Prayer, you know that part about uh, forgiving those who trespass against us? That prayer almost presupposes that our need for extending forgiveness for trespasses, if not a daily thing, will be a, a frequent thing. Trespasses can take many forms, but when they happen, you know it. And your human nature wants to answer it in many uh, unbiblical ways. But we have a clear mandate from God, which we'll look at today, to forgive. As hard as it is, we learn to forgive. So forgiveness is hard. And perhaps the uh, writer, the Christian writer, C.S. Lewis, summed it up best when he wrote, everyone thinks forgiveness is a great idea until they have something to forgive. Not often do we consider what forgiveness means in the context of our relationships until we are faced with a situation that requires us to practice it. Forgiveness is one of those things we don't really take time to prepare our hearts to do. We just sort of respond in the moment 
to whatever situations arise in which we feel we have been wronged. In those moments, many of us might find, if we really stop and think about it, that we don't have any idea of what true forgiveness involves. You see, the thing about forgiveness is it is never without cost. To forgive someone means to pay close attention to, to acknowledge, to notice just exactly how you felt wronged, and then in spite of that knowledge, to choose to show that person grace. Nothing is gained by not acknowledging the hurt, but instead of facing it squarely, we tend to pretend it away like it didn't happen. Now Jesus is the ultimate example of what forgiveness, real, grueling, costly forgiveness, looks like. Forgiveness is complex and takes an intentional amount of love that we humans know nothing about. But God, working through us, can give us the strength and ability to forgive one another of even the cruelest of harms. In Matthew 18, 21, and 22, we read about Peter coming to Jesus and deciding he has a number in his mind that his brother might sin against him and then uh, he wouldn't have to forgive him anymore. He said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him as many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. That's a lot of times to forgive someone. I don't know about you, but in my human finite mind, I can hardly comprehend forgiving someone that many times, let alone once when I feel wrong badly. So why does the Bible and even Jesus himself require, command, that this measure of grace from us? The answer is simple. Forgive as you have been forgiven. In my opinion, you can only practice true forgiveness if you first understand how truly forgiven that you are. Without first understanding the grace, love, and mercy displayed for us on the cross, we can't possibly understand how much we have been forgiven at a time when we deserved it the least. Scripture takes it a step further and actually commands us to forgive as we have been forgiven. We see this principle spoken of throughout Scripture. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Likewise, Colossians 3 and 13 says, Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Matthew 6, 14 and 15 makes an even bolder reason why we should forgive one another. And I quote, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. The forgiveness is not something we can just choose to do on our own. I believe forgiveness is only done when our hearts are prepared ahead of time 
to forgive others. If we believe we can just summon up the willpower and love and grace to forgive someone the instant we are wronged, with no prior forethought and prayer on our part, I think we will find we are setting ourselves up to fail. Because again, forgiving those we love is easy. Forg forgiving those we hate or who hate us requires quite literally a supernatural ability to forgive that can only be found in Christ. So forgiveness means spending time in God's word, in prayer, in community, growing in your faith and understanding just how deeply we all have been forgiven. Forgiveness is a choice but it is also birthed out of the dependence on the one who gives us the power and ability to act on such a choice. Forgiveness is hard and painful and feels contrary to our nature, but it is rewarding and healing because when we forgive, we give to God the circumstances that are out of our control and we trust in his wisdom. You are given the ability to forgive and love and minister to people like never before because you are not operating now out of your own might but out of God's might in you. You are operating out of the power of the Holy Spirit, which is a power beyond anything our earthly minds can understand. So when we choose to forgive, we do experience a relief and a freedom from pain like never before. God heals us of our wounds by showing us they are his to carry. And we can rest in the knowledge that, quote, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. We're blessed this morning to have a couple visitors in church who have consented to come and share their testimonies with us. There are a couple of people who know about forgiveness. They know what it is to forgive they know what it is to be forgiven. At this time, I invite Renee and Maria to come up. Good morning. Um, it's a blessing to be here. Um, for those of you that sat through my sobbing experience in the spring. Um, hopefully you can find something in this still. I appreciate you allowing us to be here. Um, public speaking is not a talent God gave me, so bear with me. Um, on September 3rd, 2015, I was met at my house by two sheriffs that had told me my mother and her lifelong friend had been killed in a car accident. Um, and the person responsible was under the influence of heroin. Um, over the next year and a half, we dealt with loss and chaos that didn't allow us to process and grieve in a normal way. We had reporters going to her house, bothering her neighbors and calling my pastor, trying to get us to interview with them. Um, there just wasn't really rest. There was always something on the news or social media. Um, you just can't really heal that way. Um, and early on, I remember my children were pretty young. They were like seven, eight, and 10-ish. 
So I know it sounds bizarre, but my shower time is kind of my time to have absolute peace to be with God. And I remember this very clear voice, like he was standing right next to me that said, pray for her. And my immediate response was no. Um, and it wasn't the first time I've said no to God. Honestly, if I'm being honest, I've said no to God more than I've said yes. Um, but this time, as soon as I said it, I knew it was wrong. Um, and I remembered a quote that I had heard ages ago that said, if you're having a hard time forgiving someone, pray for them. It may not change them, but it'll change you. So I put it to the test, and initially I was like, those, those of you who have children have had children, right? You tell them to do something, they don't want to do it. They do it anyway, but it's with an attitude of not grace. <laughs> and um, that was very much me to begin with. I did it because I knew I had to, not because I wanted to. Um, but it's true that in time, the prayer changed my heart to bring me to a place of I wanted to pray for her. And eventually, I moved into feeling concern for her. God would put thoughts in my mind like, I can't imagine waking up every day with a burden of knowing that I took two people's lives. Um, things like that, God, God kept putting in my heart, in my thoughts, and he brought me to a place where I started to feel real concern and real love for her, like genuine love, which I never thought would be possible. Um, it didn't happen immediately, but a couple of years after the accident, God opened a door through a friend who knew of what Maria was doing to, she really took a risk. She was very brave in telling me where she was, what she was doing, and it opened the door for me to reach out to her. Um, that was about four years ago, I guess. Um, and God has brought us to a place of grace that I could have never imagined and a love for her that I wouldn't have thought was possible. Um, I get to say she's my sister in Christ. Um, we spend time together, we text each other, we, it, it's, in, as Mark said, it is a supernatural, only God could do it. Um, I also love a quote from C.S. Lewis that says, being a Christian is forgiving the inexcusable, because we have been forgiven of the inexcusable. Yeah. <laughs> so I am Maria. I am the person who took the lives of Renee's mom and her lifelong partner, Bob. And um, when you say praying for people doesn't always help them, but it helps you, in this case, that is so far from the truth. Um, so I woke up. I woke up from the accident in, um, in the hospital and I heard on the news, I was hearing my name. And I was hearing that I'd killed two people. And it was um, just the most unbelievable thing you can imagine. It was not um it just felt like <laughs> so we brought some tissues because last time we did this we had like two mcdonald's napkins <laughs> that we were sharing for this but um i just thought this is not there's no there's no way that this is the truth of what happened prior to this accident although i was an active drug user um I had never hurt anybody. 
I had never had any trouble with the law or anything of the sort. Even people who hurt me, I had zero desire for them to have pain. And um, so fast forward, when I, by the time I was coherent, I was already in um, cuffs. In the, I was chained to the bed and um, and went from there to jail. And you know, in I, I was blessed a little bit because I didn't have social media and I didn't have any of that. But when I was in um, uh, where you're just held alone in a cell um, waiting to be processed, it was a holiday weekend. And there was no sense of time other than the light and when they would bring in uh, a meal. But um, I had this overwhelming... So one of the things that Renee talks about is one of her children saying, how come, how come she could be brought back? Why couldn't they do that for Grandma and Bob? And I had the same thought. Um, so my first thought was, I can't, I can't live. I, it, the only answer is suicide, because how can I possibly live? They didn't live. And um, my second thought to that was, this is, you know what, if they need, to, I can't allow my family and Renee and her family and Bob's family to be here dealing with the consequences of my actions and not be here with them facing that every day. And um, God and I had a little thing. And prior to this, I was not, although I grew up, my, my mom's family was very um, Christian, I just... I didn't have a connection with God. I didn't have a relationship with God. And in that jail cell, I had a connection. <laughs> we had a whole little thing. And he said, follow me. Follow me. Follow me every step of the way, and I promise you everything will be okay. And at that point, I was fairly certain that I would be in jail for the next um, rest of my life. Um, I don't, didn't know the jail system. I didn't know how that works. And I knew if that was the case, that it would be okay. That God would take care of my children if I was supposed to be in jail. Then there was a message for me to share in jail. Um, and that carried me. I mean, I believed 100% that um, as long as I just kept taking steps in his, um, in his way, doing what he wanted, then everything would be okay and it is amazing the blessings that have come to my life I got to get I was in jail for about a year and a half I got to get out get my kids all back my husband came back to me um, I was able to get a job serving um, people with addictions and um, I wouldn't say that I bring people to Christ maybe I do maybe I don't but my unshaking um, knowledge, belief, I don't know what you want to call it, in God has definitely um, rubbed off on some folks. And um, so when you say that, you know, it, might, it, it does something for you, but not other people, Renee changed my life. I guarantee you there were a lot of prayers out there for everybody. And God heard hers, I promise you, above all the other ones. And and, and it changed my life, um, you know, the fact that we can, we can do this together. I just am mm -hmm. blown away at all the time by the forgiveness. I mean, who, there are times in my life where I couldn't forgive my husband for, like, not, you know, rinsing his dish or dumping <laughs> his mouth. And I'm just blown away by Renee's ability to forgive and her family and people who see that I mean it is life-changing it is so life-changing it is such a testament to God being real and mm -hmm. active and with us every day and that's what makes it his story right this is yeah. not something that could have ever happened on our own um, I had someone ask me how I know God is the only way the only religion the only whatever and I can just say I've seen too much. I've seen too much that he's done for me to believe anything else. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He's good.
God is God is great, and to be able to tell his story is so so wonderful. Yeah. I feel like we really fit this all into a small yes. piece. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we're missing pieces. Yeah. But. I know that last time we kind of opened it up for some questions, and it was really um, helpful. So I want to offer that. If there are questions, concerns, anything of the sort, we'd be happy to answer them. Can you tell us how you met? Yeah, so um, a woman that I grew up with works for... Um, Re... Yes. It's, I, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the place, but it works with people who have been charged. Restorative justice. Thank you. So people that are charged typically of more minor crimes and, or even they help people coming out of prison who they're trying to help people make amends in some way to give them some dignity back in their lives to help them realize like there's more than where I am right now things can change and through her work she had met Maria and seen the work that Maria was doing and she really took a chance she told me she debated about it a long time I had gone with her it was something I was looking at volunteering for because it was what God put in my heart I thought of Maria and like other people like her that needed someone to care about them <clears throat> and um, I had gone to um, a presentation they were giving and she was kind of strange on the way home but she never mentioned it and then a few days later she texted me and said you know I, I've debated it a long time and I wasn't sure if I should say anything or not but I've met Maria I've seen the amazing things she's doing in the world of addiction and helping people and it seemed like something you needed to know about and that was the open door God gave me I was able to look up where she was working <laughs> and go scroll through the um, employees and clicked on her email and it's like good morning this is a totally random out of nowhere thing but this is who I am and I just wanted to see how you're doing and that was the open door that led to this yeah yeah that was a thing I got to work and I opened my email and I was like, <laughs> and I will tell you, I have prayed for that moment since the accident happened. I mean, from the very beginning, I wanted so badly to find these families and throw myself at their feet, not for forgiveness, but so they could like beat me or whatever they needed to do to find you know they had didn't have a chance through all this to say the things that they wanted oh that they wanted to say wait <laughs> backtrack so i was so grateful for that but let me back up for one second because um we were it was we were in court for sentencing so mm -hmm. now we've I've been in jail for a year and something, and we finally made a, a plan for what my sentencing was going to be. And at a sentencing hearing, you get a chance, all the victims get a chance to say what they want to say, because we couldn't talk to each other for a long time, legally. We weren't allowed to, even after I was out of jail. There were, um, they always put um, restrictions on that. Anyway, and... Um, I had written this whole letter about how God changed, this whole thing, God came to me, changed my heart, and I am just forever um, uh, working for him, I guess, and how, um, yes, it's been a, a, an awful thing, but I will not let your mom's death go, on, go in vain. I will work the rest of my life to provide good in some way and um, to try to not do anything negative, which is a little unrealistic, but um, I, I will, I promise that I will not let this th uh, be in vain, right? And, um, and I talked a lot about God and my attorneys said, absolutely not. You cannot read that. 
Every, the judges don't want to see that. Every criminal says, oh, I've been changed. Oh, God changed me. I promise. I'm a changed person. I said, but that's really, that's what happened. <laughs> They're like, yeah, I would leave that out. And um, <laughs> it was so amazing because every person in that courtroom spoke about Jesus Christ and about God. It was unbelievable. People got up on the stand and openly said, talked about Jesus Christ and his place in this whole thing. It was just unbelievable. And then Renee's attorney got up and read her statement, and it was like, hey, we really just pray for you and hope that you can use this as an opportunity to create good in the world and that God um, will connect with you. And it just was like exactly what I had written and um, so the whole courtroom was I mean we were just so all in tears about this so that was that was back prior to and there's Bob's family as well who um, is involved in this and we haven't had that same kind of closure but I did so I attend um, AA meetings and I'm pretty active in that and I'm also really honest and so I'm going through all of this, and I find out later that one of Bob's brother's best friend has been in the meetings this whole time. And so there's God, again, allowing me to communicate to this family who I just so badly wanted to reach out to. Um, and I don't know. So, yeah, we got to meet, and we're just little by little doing things but this um i got to go to her church which was also her mother's church so that was terrifying <laughs> but we're trying yeah. to take little steps because what renee has been able to do is unbelievable this is not human the fact that she could be forgiving me and standing next to me and reaching out to me with with jokes and love and you know, we we cry together. Mm -hmm. We just do all kind. It's just pray not together. a human thing. Nope. It's totally a God thing. Mm -hmm. And um, to be able to share that, I had a direction I was going with that, but I, I, it's gone now. <laughs> so just to be able to share that with people is is so amazing. And for people to see that, like, there's no, there's nothing we can't forgive with God. With God, yeah. I can't fathom it without His direction. I don't think it's possible without his guidance and reminders and changing of hearts. It's not a, I don't think it's a possible thing outside of him. Well, and for talking about social media and stuff online, people are so quick to have really negative things to say online. Um, and I, there are a lot of people I've had to switch doctors a number of times because people have a, they have a feeling about me that they, is not a great feeling. And I don't blame them for that. That is, that is their uh, thing. And um, but that was something else God had put in my heart was, imagine getting up every day and being judged by the worst day of your life. And that was kind of an eye-opening thing as well because that's what she was facing. And most of us don't have to ever deal with that. We, most of us, our worst days, we get to tuck down away somewhere privately and most people don't know about it and they would never know it by walking down the street. But I had people say, oh, I saw her this place. Never met before, but they knew her face and knew what she had done. Yeah, it's a whole thing for sure, but it is deserved. The grace and love that I've been given is undeserved, and thank God that God is a mm -hmm. <laughs> forgiving, graceful, merciful God. Um, my life is completely changed by the fact that he came down, touched Renee's heart. She was willing to go with that and forgive me, and then to be able to receive that forgiveness. In my, when I got out of jail, I decided it was a good plan to go on social media and read what everybody was saying about me, which was awful. And it set me exactly what you said. In the corner, I never wanted to die so much in my life. I just, 
it was it was um, it, it broke me but what got me back up on my feet was that I didn't die and I know we can't say God God caused bad things to happen but he sure can make good things happen out of it and if I were going to be um, in a ball in a corner or go back to using drugs or kill myself or any of those things then I'm not doing them then I might as well have died why you know I'm here and so I, I have to be available to help people and that is not doing anything good um, so yeah we Aren't you glad you asked? <laughs> Twenty <laughs> minutes later, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> Anyone else want to take a shot to see how much more burn time we can burn through? <laughs> can you tell of your interaction with your children? Her interaction with them? Oh. Oh. Well, I, so we've done this together. So we, I didn't meet her kids for a little while, and that was really It wasn't scary. until spring when we came here. Yeah, She had met was, my husband. Um couple of times. I, I met think. your husband before yeah. I met you. Yes. I was texting um, her. I was also through her. through her work and his work. Um, but she hadn't met my children face to face until we came here. Yeah. And that was you know, God is so good because he gives me he gives us all these little pieces at a time because he knows we can't handle all of it at one time. And it was probably a good thing because it would have been crushing. It's one thing to note logically to know things you know this mm -hmm. is what I caused um, but little by little God has given me a chance to feel that pain and remorse and um, and seeing your kids was you know just that whole somebody took my grandparents away from us and what a great mom to be able to set this example of love um, but I got to interact with one of her daughters and I said, well, what is it like? It was a different day. Oh, yeah. And I was like, well, what is this like for you? You know, the person who, who took your grandma's life is standing here joking in your kitchen. Like, that must be really hard for you. And she's like, yeah, it's weird. It is awkward. It's kind of, but she was so... I mean, Renee's such a good mom, and her kids would never have said anything bad. But her kids, like, when I met them, they ran up to me and gave me hugs. Every single one of them, even her and they're teenagers boyfriend. and adults, and yes, yeah. Becky's boyfriend. <laughs> they it all, was, yeah. It was just yeah. insane, you know, the mm -hmm. fact that you're able to do this and teach your children this. What a world! When we live in a world where the first thing we want to do is talk badly about somebody. To set that example is just the most, I could only hope I, that I think about you all the time in my own parenting and in my own, like, oh, what am I, what example am I setting? You know, if I'm like whining about this, that wasn't the word, that oh, was I in my head. I <laughs> whine about, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> but like, what a great example. Anything. So, anything good in me is because of Jesus. There's no question in my mind about that. Yeah. yeah. How are we doing on time? And are there <laughs> any other We're not questions? quite at 12. <laughs> <laughs> or we are happy to wrap things up as well. Yeah. So why don't we wrap things up? We'll step down, but I think we'll be available after for a few minutes if anybody had questions or, um, I don't know, thoughts that they wanted to put out there, we're practicing on you guys. So <laughs> um, it's really good for us to know, like, what would have been better to hear to get the message of forgiveness across? Or what else would you want to hear to get that message across? Um, yeah, that's all. Or if you just want a hug. I'm a hugger. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for being thank listening you. to us. Thank you. Well, thank you so much <clears throat> for sharing, and Mark, for your words as well. Um, 
Mark wouldn't get up and close. <laughs> but I guess after hearing <clears throat> that story, it will do us no good, will it, if it's just, oh, that was a powerful story. But my question, and to make it practical, <clears throat> this is on a different level than we usually think of forgiveness. But how about the level we're at right now? Is there somebody in your mind this morning <clears throat> that you have, up till now anyway, refused to forgive? Hmm? And if there is a person, I've had people say to my face, I could never forgive that person for what they did to me. But here's where the rubber meets the road, isn't it? Here's where the miracle happens. And uh, if you, even Jesus said, if you come to the altar to offer your gift and there you remember, yeah, somebody has something against you, he says, leave your gift at the altar, go make it right, be reconciled, then come and offer your gift. And so this is necessary. And if somebody's struggling with this today, uh, God is just giving you an opportunity to practice what he commands, which again is impossible, is it not, without the Holy Spirit? As we've been seeing a living example of that today at a, at a high level. My sister, I think it, most of you know this, but my sister was in a car accident in Germany, head-on collision with somebody who had been drinking. And uh, the man who hit her died instantly in the crash and left my sister in a wheelchair to this day. And uh, I went with him to, it was the same deal, we couldn't meet that family till for some time. But the day came where Tom, her husband, and I went to this woman's house, or the wife of the one who was killed, just to, just to say we have no ill feelings Towards, towards her because my sister's in a wheelchair today and it was able to let him know that we forgive you there's nothing you know, don't hold we're not angry with your husband because of this happened again that's a miracle too and my sister said if she's in a wheelchair and if one person gets saved through all it's worth it all and uh, forgiveness though uh, I talked with the, a chaplain that works with hospice this week and he told me something I never thought I'd hear, hear. But he works with people dying on their deathbeds. And he said, people of faith, the number one thing that people of faith, no matter some kind of faith, the thing they struggle most with is unforgiveness. Even in the last hours, what they're thinking about is, and so just take this as God given me <laughs> something I heard this week and even meeting with a man on his deathbed this week. But just thinking of that fact, the thing people of faith are thinking about, I have not forgiven somebody, and they don't want to deal with it. And when the chaplain brings it up that we need to deal with this, they're very uncomfortable and they don't want to. This is people of, of faith. I suppose people of no faith don't care anyway. But I thought, wow, that, that says a lot. Why wait till our last day? <laughs> Did Jesus stay to wait till your last day to make everything right? So why don't we just, uh, for a moment anyway, have a, just uh, some silent time for you to communicate with God in your own heart. If there's somebody, I would determine to do something about it today, if you can, by all means, with the person that has wronged you or you, there's unforgiveness. So in order for this to be more than just a nice story, but something practical, living, and you'll experience, I believe, that same joy that same um, piece of making things right. So I really don't know how to end, but I think this would be a proper way to just have a few moments of, of just searching your own heart and of God. I'm not asking you to drum something up, boy. You know if there's something, and it'll be revealed to you in your heart. You don't have to drum this up. It's the Holy Spirit will bring a person to your mind or something you've been holding off on. So let's just take a few moments of silence and heart searching with you and God alone.